I'm, I'm, I'm fired up today. Well, today I'm going to talk about a lesson in the drought. The lesson in the drought today, now don't leave when I say it. Don't turn me off, amen. The lesson in the drought today is that we're going to learn the power of repentance. The power, now I know some of you right now are like, well, I might go to school ahead and pick another church that's like preaching on hope today, <laughs> amen. Don't turn off telling you the word, the, the Lord's word ha- has a powerful word for you today. But here's how we're going to entitle that. We're going to entitle it, sometimes we got to clean the house. Anybody ever need to clean the house? Anybody's house messy right now? Yeah? If I said to you right now, hey, I'm stopping by right after church, who would it stress out? Yeah? Jennifer, you'd get stressed out if I was like, hey, I'm going to invite the whole church over here in a few moments. We're just going to bring them on over to the house. She'd be like, she would sneak out, right? Soon as, soon as the next prayer moment, you'd look up and be like, where'd the pastor's wife go? To clean the house, right? And, and if you have teenagers, how hard is it to keep a house clean with teenagers? Amen. Like, is it that hard to put up a cereal bowl? Like some wives are nudging their, their husbands right now. I'm going to flip it on you. How about some of the wives pick up your shoes? I'm talking about like, it's not just my shoes on the floor. We we all like it's just time to clean the house. And sometimes you gotta get out the gear to clean the house. You might have to walk through your house with disinfectant. Amen. Just gonna be sure I don't get contaminated up here. All right. Sometimes you need a little. This is the stuff we spray in the worship center between every service. By the way, just a dis to that. I sprayed a lot. If I go nuts up here, it's because I just got myself a little whiff of. Whew. We don't do that here at this church if you're visiting. Um, <laughs> sheer accident. Uh, we need to, need to get in the Word today. We're going to be in the uh, Old Testament book today, 2 Chronicles 33, as we talk about cleaning the house today. And, uh, and so you'll, you'll want to find that if, if you're new to church and you don't know where that is. Just turn to the uh, table of contents right in the beginning of your Bible. It's in the Old Testament portion of that. And look for Second Chronicles. And that's where we'll be today. Uh, and we'll open that up in a minute. But I remember when I was a kid, when I was a kid, my, my dad's a contractor, mom's a school teacher. And, and uh, so uh, they were very, very busy. And so they hired a, a cleaning service to come into our house. And this young lady came into our house every single, uh, I think it was twice a month, she came to clean our house. And, and I'll never forget my mom would wake us up the day before that it was time to clean the house or if it was during the school week, we would have to come home and she would say, all right, boys, to my brother Sean and I, all right, boys, clean the house. Hold up, Mom. You know the cleaning service is coming tomorrow. I don't want it to be dirty for her. Mama, if you're watching, I love you. You know it, but you know it's true. Just if my mom's watching right now, she needs to comment, I like a clean house. Amen. And um, because she does. And she would always look at me and be like, clean the house. Mom, like you know that's that lady's job. Like I'm taking away the opportunity for her to work. No, you're not. I'm still gonna pay her. No, but forget it. Right? Teenagers, eventually, here's the best thing you can do for your parents. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to clean the house. Amen, parents? Y'all don't want to clap for that one. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to clean the house. And I want to talk to you today out of 2 Chronicles 33, how a young 8-year-old king felt called by Almighty God, an 8-year-old, who by the age of 26, God put on his heart that it was time to clean the house because the temple had been defiled by a lot of pagan activity, some by his grandfather, Manasseh. Manasseh had stepped up, his, his grandfather had come in, and you can study this in, in the chapters right there in Second Chronicles, or you can flip over to Kings, it's in both passages there, but Manasseh had come in, and man, Manasseh was a bad king, a wicked, wicked king. He would uh, create these altars to worship the God called Baal, and he would create these moments of sacrifice, human sacrifices, by the way, he would do, even sacrifice some of his family members. He was a very man that took the prophet Isaiah, that is believed in Isaiah chapter 11, when it says that Isaiah, that prophets were cut in two by Saul's, that Isaiah was sold in half by the great king Manasseh. He was one messed up king. And this is this little bitty boy named Josiah's granddad. Now, it's fair to say later in Manasseh's life that we learn in Second Chronicles uh, chapter 33, really verses Gosh, even from 
12 all the way through 14. It says, In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord. Uh, his God had humbled himself greatly. By the way, humility, you're going to learn this all day today. Humility always leads to repentance. Pride drives us from repentance. Humility leads us to repentance. And Manasseh, this, this bad king, had a humbling moment. God redeemed him. God brought him back. It says in the end of that in verse 13, then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. And, and I'm not preaching this today. This is not the sermon today. But can I give you a sermon within the sermon? The sermon within the sermon is this, whether you're watching online and right now you feel like I can't walk in the church I'm too dirty, I'm too sinful, I'm too jacked up, I'm too messed up. Can I tell you, nobody's too messed up for God. Nobody's too lost for Almighty God. Nobody's too far gone from my God who came to save us, right? Nobody's too far gone. And let me say this to people watching online for a moment. If you're in our community and you're saying, man, you don't understand, Pastor, I'm really messed up. I want you to know you are welcome here. You're welcome to walk in this room as dirty as you are as dirty as you believe you are, because we want to welcome you as a church. We want to welcome you for who you were made to be. You are made to be a follower of Almighty God, all right? So that's a sermon within the sermon. Y'all are welcome, all right? And uh, then this happened. So Manasseh, who was king from the age of 12 all the way to the age of 55, he passes away. His son, who knew only to do wrong, who only did evil in the eyes of the Lord, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 22. His name was Amon. Amon was only king for two years. Now, all this history leads up to a fascinating deal. Because back then, the kings were so pagan, they took this deal called the Book of the Law. It's also called, in your Bible, Deuteronomy. The Book of the Law is what they'll refer to back then. They took the Book of the Law, and they hid it in the temple. They hid it in the temple because all the kings would have destroyed the law. Matter of fact, they didn't have what we know as Passover, the celebration of being freed from Egypt. They did not have that now since King Hezekiah led it, which was somewhere around probably 50 to 60 years before. So the book of the law has been hidden. Nobody's been practicing the ways of God. And now this little boy named Josiah becomes king at the age of eight. An eight-year-old boy. Are there any eight-year-old boys in here right now? Anybody got an eight-year-old? You're eight years old right back there in the back. My eight-year-old brother. He is the new king. How about that? We just appointed you king. You're king over your house. His parents are like, no, you're not. (laughs) How would you like that, mama and daddy? Your little eight-year-old now is the king of Judea. Now can determine whether he can say, off with your head. You got to tell him to clean the house? I would. Boy, clean the house. Right? Um. This little eight-year-old boy becomes king named Josiah. And Josiah begins to evaluate the ways that are taking place in the current culture and how messed up the current culture is. And then he fast forward about 18 years later. I'm telling you a little bit of history to build to the moment, right? 18 years later, he's 26 years old, and he begins to go to the temple, and he realizes the temple's been defiled, and it's all messed up, and all this sin has creeped back in, and all these false idols have creeped in, and the culture is all destroyed and moved way away from the ways of the Lord, and Josiah decides it's time to go clean up the temple. It's time to clean the house. It's time to disinfect things, right? It's time to grab the gear that we need. My wife just said, don't start spraying that, so I got to spray a little bit. Um, Not that I've got any rebellious nature in me at all, but sometimes you got to repent of the sin within, amen? Um, Sometimes we need to disinfect. Josiah knew a disinfected moment needed to happen. And so he goes in and he begins to clean the temple. Watch what happens in 2 Chronicles 34, verse 14. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Helichi, the priest, the high priest there, found, he found. Whoa, did y'all see it? Everybody say found. Don't miss it. If you're online, just type found. He found 
the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. He found the law. He found the Word of God. He found this new this new thing that he had heard about, people talked about, but he's only 26 years old. The word of the Lord had been hidden way longer than that. He had never known about it. Now he finds the word of the Lord and begins to read the word of the Lord. And he realizes they moved as a culture into this sinful state because they hid the word. Can I give this to you today? Any time you allow the word of God to dry up in your life, you allow sin to come in. Anytime you allow the word of God to drop in your life. You know what the spiritual drought is or what the drought is today? The drought is not a physical drought that happened in the early days. The drought is a spiritual drought. And I think in America today, in the church of America today, in the Christian church of the world today, in Baptist churches of the world today, I think a lot of people have become full of a spiritual drought They're all dried up. And we need Almighty God to step into the temple, right? We're going to talk about this, but we're the temple. Y'all remember when the veil was torn in two, and in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came for me and for you to live within us, and our bodies became the temple, according to 1 Corinthians. And here we are. We need a little cleaning up because we got in a spiritual drought. And I would bet there's a lot of people in a spiritual drought today. And what happens when we get in a spiritual drought? We push the word aside and we let sin creep in. Can I just give this to you? Don't send yourself into a drought by pushing God's word out. Don't push God's word out. Can I just preach one of the most basic truths for a moment from God's word? If you want to live outside of a spiritual drought, give time every day to the word of God. You're not going to live out what you don't put in. You're not going to find hope in what you're not breathing hope in. You've got to breathe it into you through the Word of God. And, and if, if I've heard it once, and you guys have heard it, and we all say it, right? Let's, can we just sit around and, and be a family wherever you're watching, all around the world? If, if you're, you're part of the family, right? We built a barn table for you, and we're all sitting around it right now. Can we just be honest? Sometimes we just get too busy to get in the Word. Amen? I'm just too busy. Pastor, I'm too busy to spend time with the God of the universe. I'm too busy, too busy to read the Bible today. I've got to go to work. Too busy to read the Bible today. Uh, I've, I've got this or I've got that and I've got, and what happens? When you stop spending time in the Word, you become spiritually empty. I just want to challenge you with this, church. This is why I challenged you at the beginning of the year to read the Bible through in one year. So that you unpack. I I didn't challenge you to grab a Bible reading plan or devotional. Although I read those every day. I'm for them. I challenge you to go through every word written in Scripture in 2020. And aren't you glad you did, by the way. Amen. And you need the word in your life, especially when you hit valleys in your life. You need the word in your life. And when we stop giving ourselves to the Word of God, what happens? It moves us to a spiritual drought. When we move to a spiritual drought, what do we do? We set down the Word of God. And look how it worked out for Judea. We set down the Word of God. When we stop investing in our life in a spiritual drought, what do we do? We stop making church the priority. We might make it a priority, or we might just say we're too busy now for church. I'll go to church again in three months. I'll go to church again in six months. I'm telling you, one of my greatest fears, can I just be vulnerable with you right now? One of my greatest fears is COVID-19 has moved people into a spiritual drought, and they started watching church online, and they've gotten so comfortable in their pajamas and on their couch that they don't even walk in the room. And there's just something about being in the room and letting the Holy Spirit breathe life into you in the room in a worship moment like we just had. And it's going to move us into a spiritual drought when we listen to the culture of today. we got to live according to the Word of God. It's a drought. It's a spiritual drought. When we move away from the Word of God, we become negative. We become negative when we get away from the Word of God. It moves us in a spiritual drought. That's why like people will come into church and they might say, well, Pastor Barron, he got up there and just started talking about money. Did you hear him? He talking about that tithe again. I don't like it when anybody talks about money. Somebody getting offline right now, like talking about money. Well, no. If that's you, keep your money. It's not about money. It's about obedience. 
See, tithing is obedience. It has zero to do. That's why it's not a amount that you give. That's why it's not a dollar figure. It's a percentage. It's just like baptism, right? But when we get in a spiritual drought, it moves us away from the understanding of the word, and it moves us into a negative spirit about the word. Be careful, church. Be careful when you have a negative spirit because it might mean you're moving away from what God wants to do with you. That's what took place in Judea. And it began to affect them. And it began to mess them up. And so what took place was they needed to clean the house. They, they just needed to pull out the cleaning gear. That, that's all they, they just needed a cleaning moment. And they needed a king that would be obedient to lead them to there. And his name was Josiah, an eight-year-old boy who is now 26. In 2 Chronicles 34, 19, we move on in the story. It says, when the king heard the word. So they read the book of the law. This is, remember, this is the first time he ever heard it. This is the first time he ever read the law that was written by Moses. When he heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. Why? Because it broke him. The book of the law threw Josiah into a state of brokenness and repentance because broken hearts lead to a repented spirit. Broken hearts lead you to this repented moment. Broken hearts lead you to the fact that my house is dirty and and, and I need to clean it up. See, they believed they were someone, Judean people believed they were someone they were not because they began to listen to the culture around them instead of the Word of God because the Word of God had been hidden. The book of the law had been hidden. So now they're listening to the narrative of the culture and the kings of the day versus who God said about them. And I would just give you this today, if that's you and you live in that today online, I would encourage you with this. I mean, you you just need to comment and say, God, free me, right? We have these moments, but you are not who this culture says you are. You are not who politics say you are. You are not a Republican. You're not a Democrat. You're not defined by your income. You're not defined by your race. You're not defined by your ideologies of societal trends. You're not defined by the different worldviews of every generation. If you have surrendered your life over to Jesus, you are defined as a child of God, period. That's who you are. Stop following all the cultural way. You are, this is you. To God to find you. Stop letting the negativity breathe life into you and say, I'm not good enough. You are. You matter to God. Why? Because this right here, if you've never read it from cover to cover, read it. It's one of the most beautiful love stories you'll ever read. It's a beautiful love story. It's a love story about a person. It's a love story about a being. It's a love story about said, let there be light. It's a love story that sacrificed an animal in Genesis chapter 3 to clothe Adam and Eve after they fell. Whoo! He clothed them after they fell. He, it's a love story that restored King David after his lustful affair. A love that changed water into wine. A love that turned tables. A love that walked on water and said, don't be afraid. A love that put back on the ear of the man who cut it off. He's going to put back on the air. A love that hung on the cross, died, rose again, and was seen. A love that burns for you. A love that burns for me. And it's a love that one day will return. And it's a love we must embrace. And to understand the love, we got to understand the word. When we understand the word, we understand the love. And we respond with love. We respond like Jesus because we recognize we don't have it all together. And it's called a repentant spirit we got to recognize it. So watch what happens. This is where the confronting piece happens, right? This is where it gets a tad uncomfortable. Because 2 Chronicles 34, verse 21, Go and inquire of the Lord for me, for the remnant of Israel and Judea, about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that's poured out on us, because those who have gone before us have not kept the word of the Lord. They haven't kept the word of the Lord, so the Lord's angry. They have not acted. Listen, action is required to get to repentance. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written in this book. Action is required. If you want to get to a repented spirit, action is required, right? It's like the leader that never accepts they fail is a leader that never grows. We all know that. If you don't accept failure, you can't accept growth. It's like the church that says, we've never done it that way before. <laughs> Which we'll never say here, by the way. Amen? Uh, we're more afraid of missed opportunity than we are of change. And so that's a pretty cool thing here 
at Trinity. But the church that says that is a church that never moves forward. It's a Christian who never accepts that they sin. It's a Christian that never accepts they sin. It's a Christian who allows pride to become their downfall. The one who is a sinner who never repents is the one who never experiences heaven one day. You see, action is required because you got to recognize your house is dirty. You recognize your house is dirty? Not your physical house. We could probably swing by and answer that for you real quick. Amen? Um, But is the house dirty? Right here. What sin have you allowed to creep in? What has pride allowed to creep in? What is anger or loneliness or frustration or lust or bitterness or unforgiveness? We could list sins all day long, but the problem is, as Christians a lot, we allow sin to creep in, but we have a tendency to point out other sin instead of look at ourselves. Josiah looked inside. You know what Josiah didn't do? It doesn't read to this that Josiah looked at the temple and he looked at Judea and he didn't go, man, those past cultures messed everything up. Man, my daddy, God bless him, my granddad was really jacked up until the end of his life. I mean, it it was all mess. He didn't didn't put the blame. He just said, we got to look internally because action is required. But watch what happened when they looked internally. 2 Chronicles 24, 27 through 28, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says concerning the words you heard. Because, watch this, this is good. It's a lean-in moment, right? Because your heart was responsive. Are you responsive to the conviction of God in your life? Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before God. That's not the last time you're going to hear the word humbled in this passage, by the way. And you humbled yourself before God. Then you heard what he spoke against this place and his people. And because you humbled yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you. Because, I, because you humbled yourself, you weren't acting too good, you weren't too big time, I have heard you. You. Why? Because humility leads to repentance. Here's a question for the day, right? Um, Are we, me, all of you, everybody watching online, are we honest with ourselves enough to recognize that we sin? Anybody feel the tension? (laughs) Um, are, Are we mature enough to recognize that we sin? Brian Mills, he messes up, which my wife should amen, right? Um, I, I, I mess up just like anybody else. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That doesn't mean I don't strive for perfection. It doesn't mean I don't strive to be more like Christ. That's why I get up every day and spend time in the Word of God because I know if I'm going to put it in, I'll live it out, and, and I want to be like Christ, but do I still sin? And, but so often I point my finger maybe at somebody else than I do it myself. And, and you know what the Bible says in Matthew? It says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eyes? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's plank in your own eye? And it calls me a hypocrite. And it says, first, take the plank out of your own eye. You know what he's saying? Humble yourself and recognize you got sin within you. And when you recognize it, I'm going to hear you. I'm going to receive. You know what I believe? That's a a picture of God's grace, his unfailing love, saying, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to redeem you. It's a beautiful picture of the grace of God that took place right here. Humility leads to repentance. And then he goes on, 2 Chronicles 24, and you get down in, uh, in verse 31, and it says, The king stood up by his pillar, and he renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commands, his statutes, his decrees, with all of his heart and with all of his soul, and obey the words of the covenant written in this book. What did he do? He, Josiah reinstated holiness and worship to Yahweh. Can, can, we, can we just do this? Can I ask you, wherever you're at in your personal walk with Jesus, maybe you're in a spiritual drought, will you reinstate holiness within? Will you reinstate Jesus within? 
Will you remember the day of your salvation? Remember the day God did something big in your life and reinstate that moment? In 1998, the year after I graduated high school, amen, anybody with me? Nobody? 98ers? Uh, 97ers? That was me. Not a good 97. A uh, few of us in the room. And we're middle-aged people now, and we claim that, right? We're not old. Some of you are thinking, man, you're old. And uh, some of you are thinking, man, you're young. Some of you are like, I, I wasn't even born yet. And uh, God bless you, little puppy. Um, but back in 1998, Matt Redman penned a phrase, and he put it in a song called The Heart of Worship. Anybody remember that song? Y'all remember that song? Remember how it goes? When the music fades. Y'all notice how my voice got deeper there? I watched that Garth Brooks documentary on Netflix, and that's what he does. And uh, since he's from Yukon, I thought I'd try it. When the music fades, right, all is stripped away. It's all gone. When all the glamour's gone, when all the fame's gone, when everybody stops looking at me, when it's all gone, and I simply come, I long just to bring something that's a worth that will bless your heart, Almighty God. I bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you require. You search much deeper within. You dig deep within my heart. You know the, the sin inside of me. You know the, the, the rebellion inside of me through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. And so what's he say? I'm coming back. I wonder who needs to come back. I wonder who needs to reinstate their walk with Jesus. I wonder who slid into sin in 2020 and you've let sin become your captive and you've let it control you and you just need to let almighty God clean you up today. You need to let the Holy Spirit breathe life into you today and say you can be renewed and then as a result when you get renewed, I'm telling you, you want to know what happens? When you get renewed, you shout a little more. When you get renewed, you lift your hands a little higher. When you get renewed, you got a little bit more joy because you know what the, you know what the other is like and when you get on the other side of the other whoo and you know God brought you there it changes you it changes you he was reinstated what did he do then he removed Josiah removed things why because he changed everything and, and as a result of repentance he, he acted and he started removing all the junk that was there and everything began to disappear can I just give this to you as we end today it is time for us to declare as followers of Jesus if you have a relationship with Jesus it is time for us to declare Lord clean the house let us get clean back up let the Christians of America be humble enough to say it's time to rise up and to recognize the sin within so that we can declare the word of God that lives inside of us. And when the Bible says, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? You are now the temple. It's you. Will you let God Almighty, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, step in and clean you up? He wants to take you and accept you just the way you are. I guarantee you there's somebody in the room that says, Pastor, you don't know, man, I'm pretty messed up. I'm pretty messed up. I've ran in rebellion. I've tried the church thing my whole life, and uh, some of you might have walked back in. Matter of fact, you know one thing I've been praying? I've been praying, Lord, everybody that drives by on Cemetery Road out there, everybody that drives by our church, God, would you convict people on Sunday morning? And just say, it, this is a Sunday. You need to turn and go to that church. That might be you today. Somebody might have tagged you online today. You, somebody might have shared this. And now you're watching and being a part. And, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's just speaking to you in your living room or in your truck or in your workplace or, or while you, wherever you're hanging out. And, and whenever you're watching this, that the Lord's just speaking into your life and saying, it is time for you to humble yourself and to give your life to Jesus. Surrender your life over to Jesus. In the church, we call it being saved. It's called salvation. It's a redemptive moment I'm speaking of when God Almighty looks at the sin and says, I receive you as you are, and I forgive you. What's it take for you to pause in your life and for you to say, I know I'm a sinner, which we say around here is easy. Um, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. 
And so I pause in my life and I surrender my life over to Jesus. And then we know this. We say it here often. Surrendered lives live surrendered. So we go live our lives surrendered unto the Lord. We begin to get in the Word. It's the starting point. It's just the beginning point. That's why we do a class on Wednesday night for new believers. Because it's not the end all. It's the beginning. But if you've never had the beginning, maybe today is the day for you. Maybe today is the day that you need to surrender your life to Jesus, whether you're in this room or you're watching with us online. And maybe today is the day that you just need to say, I need to give my life to Christ. And if you say that, you say, Pastor, how do I do it? You pause in your life and you go broken before the Lord and you say, God, I'm giving my life to you. Now, in the midst of that moment, you say, Pastor, would you lead me in a prayer to do that in my life? Sure, I'll lead you in a prayer. No magic in the prayer. I pray. But maybe in that moment, God wants to do something big in your life. So I just want to invite everybody to pray with me. Everybody to pray with me. And if you need to give your life to Jesus, I want you to pray this. I want you to say, Dear Heavenly Father, the best way I know how, I turn my back on my sin and I give my life to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. I promise to never be the same again. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, I want you to text the number on the screen. Just text in. If you're in the room, you can also fill out a connection card in the seat back in front of you. Just fill it out. You can drop it in the offering baskets on your way out. You can just drop that connection card. Any way we can pray for you, we'll be happy to do that as well. Just fill that connection card out and drop it in the offering basket on the way out. Or grab your phone, take a picture of this real quick. You can text us after service if you want. If you're watching online right now, just text. Matter of fact, text in and then just type in the comments and say, today I gave my life to Jesus. Today I responded to the gospel. And just let us hear from you from one of our online services that are taking place uh, this week, and, and we want to speak into your life that way, and we want to help you with that. But you can text in anytime you're watching this. If you're in the room, I, I challenge you, don't leave without texting in. Don't leave without filling out a card. But then can I say in a, a word to all the ones in the room, you know you have a relationship with Jesus? Can I talk to all of us for a moment? Can I talk to all the ones online that you know you have a relationship with Jesus? Have you ever paused and said, God, how do I need to clean the house right now? What do I need to disinfect? What is a virus inside of me that is taking over? And I need to get rid of it because it's driving me to a spiritual drought. And I need the Holy Spirit to breathe life into me. I don't know what it is. And I'm not going to start rolling out sins, right? None of us want that. Whatever God's speaking into your life today, would you receive it? You might want to come to this altar and just pray. You might want to pray with one of our pastors up front and just meet with them and pray. You might want to sit in your seat and just turn your palms up and say, God, I give this to you. You might want to stay seated. You might want to stand in a moment and say, God, I, I give this to you. And you just Can we just have a moment with the Lord? We call it a reflective moment, a moment of invitation, a moment to invite you to respond to what God is doing within your life right now. So Lord, this is your moment. God, speak to us because we don't want to live with a dirty house, with a dirty temple. And sometimes we just need to clean up. Sometimes we just need to pause and we know we got a relationship with you, but we just let a little sin creep in. And God, would you let us be honest and humble and give that to you today so that we can go live as kingdom influencers this week? Jesus, would you get us out of the spiritual droughts we're living in? In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Church.